Hi, I'm Randy Cantrell. Welcome to the Year of the Peer podcast with Leo Batari. This podcast is based on a simple truth. Who you surround yourself with matters. Author and keynote speaker Leo Batari will interview thought leaders from all walks of life who will share how they leverage peer advantage and show you how engaging your peers more purposefully can hold the key to greater success in business and in life. Today's guest is J.J. Ramberg. J.J. Ramberg is the host of MSNBC's Your Business. Now in its 11th year, it's the only television show dedicated to issues affecting small business owners. She is co-author of It's Your Business, 183 Essential Tips That Will Transform Your Small Business, and a business owner in her own right, as a co-founder with her brother Ken of GoodShop.com. Before joining MSNBC, Ramberg was a reporter at CNN, where she covered a wide range of topics, ranging from breaking news to profiles of the country's top business leaders. Ramberg is a graduate of Duke University and Stanford Graduate School of Business. Let's get started. JJ Ramberg, welcome to the show today. Uh, Leo, it's so nice to see you. It's been too long. <laughs> it has, it has. And uh, no, it's just great, great to have you here. I know you've been traveling. I know you've been super busy. So I really appreciate uh, the time. Yes, we're all busy. It's just, it is the mantra of the, of the day. <laughs> well, as you know, uh, the real, I think, simple premise that we're trying to work with on this show all year long is this idea of who you surround yourself with matters. And yep. for you, when I think about entrepreneurship and business and all, you've been surrounded by it your whole life. You grew up with it and love for you to hear about the influence of your, of your family in that regard. Yeah, you know, it's, it's absolutely in my blood. And when I think about entrepreneurship and how my family influenced me it, it it's uh, hindsight is 2020 right it's so apparent how it did but going through life you don't even realize how something is affecting you so I am the granddaughter of two entrepreneurs my grandfather on my dad's side moved from Mexico not speaking a word of English with a very mm. young family and was a peddler basically door-to-door -door peddler and then eventually opened up his own furniture store and so my dad worked with him and then my dad opened his own company a couple of them my mom's dad was a, he was sort of a quintessential entrepreneur sort of had money lost money had money lost money <laughs> opened a ton of businesses and then um, my mom got from him she was a stay-at-home mom until she was 46 this was pre-internet mind you when stay-at-home moms were not starting companies she and my brother started a company, uh, which eventually turned to an internet company, and they sold it to Monster.com. Mm. And so I had a front row seat to watching both of my parents. But it wasn't like my parents were saying, hey, you need to start a business or you need to be an entrepreneur. They didn't talk about it that way. It just, it just truly became just something that I, I saw. It, it was normal to me. Well, and, you know, yeah, just by example, right? And then... You know, I'd love for you to tell us, too, about you and your brother started your company, kind of where that came from. I know that uh, Katrina, I believe, was one of the real impetuses for that and wanting to do what you did the way you did it. But, um, you know, I think so many people know of you on MSNBC and, and hosting your show, and maybe fewer people know that you, too, are an entrepreneur. So I'd love for you to tell us about this business and uh, you, you know, working with your brother. I'm sure. I, I, I love to talk about nothing but my business, as we all know. So, so I always wanted to do something in the social responsibility world, right? Since the, the early days, when I was a kid and ate my first Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And because I worked at my mom's company as a kid, I, I was really interested in small businesses, but I didn't have an idea until I was in my 30s. I just like to say that out there because there's this great pressure to start something, I think, in our world right now. And you know, I, I didn't, I couldn't have back then. I didn't have an idea, but Ken and I started a company which is now called Good Shop. And Ken is, is uh, my brother who started a business with my mom. So we got to do this together. And the whole idea, Good Shop has, has two parts to it. Um, one of it is this socially responsible part, Good Shop Give, where we work with thousands and thousands of retailers so that every time you shop on their site, a percentage of what you spend goes back to your favorite cause. And we actually have this browser plugin. It's get gumdrop, getgumdrop.com if anyone's interested, 
where it follows you around the web so that automatically the money goes back to your cause. It is effortless. And wow. particularly in this time, no matter where you fall on the political spectrum, I feel like people are really dying to do something, right? To help whatever cause they care about. And so it's really, um, it's, 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 it's done well, um, but it's really had sort of a renewed importance, I think. Um, and then the other part is that, and this fits into Good Shop Give as well, is, is we list the best coupons and deals for all of these stores. And so that every time you go to a store, again, automatically those coupons and deals activate on your screen so you don't have to go to Google and go search Gap coupons anymore. So it, it's been fun, and it's been amazing to get to do this with my brother. So we, we've got $12 million for causes so far. And, and just to get to work with him, who I've learned so much from, this is his second go-round. He already started and, and sold a successful company. Um, it's, it's been just, it's been fantastic. It's been fantastic for me and him, for my whole family who's involved, and I just love it. You know, one of the things I love about it, though, is, you know, I think companies for a long time were really about, hey, if we do really, really well and we're profitable, we want to give back to our communities, right? We want to give back to causes that are important to us. Um, but what you've done and what so many companies do now is they are inextricably interwoven now. The, the doing good and doing well are all part of the value proposition. They're all part of the business model. And that's what I love. And I, I think you were really, you know, among the earlier companies doing that and really uh, saw that uh, in that way. Yeah, thank you. We started this 11 years ago. So, so we were pretty early on in this whole world. And I agree. I mean, look, I'll tell you one thing that I learned along the way is that you definitely have to have a good product, right? And, and I think no one can think that if they just say, I, I launched this company and we're going to help something that it's going to fly. Uh, we, we learned that and we, um, you know, spent a lot of years developing the product itself, but we've had this social responsibility part of our company all along. Well, you know, so here you are, um, you, you grew up in this, you know, entrepreneurial um, family. But tell us how journalism has kind of woven into that, right? I mean, a, a career at CNN, uh, then MSNBC, an author. I mean, you kind of keep bringing these things, you know, together and really combining uh, business with your uh, work as a journalist. So tell us yes, a little bit. Yes, and like, meow. <laughs> exactly. It wasn't supposed to happen at the same time. I will tell you that much. <laughs> but it's, I've been really lucky. So I, I was a journalist. I, I, I worked at NBC News. I left to go to business school. And then I worked. It was 1998. So I worked in the Internet. And then I missed journalism. So I went back to be a journalist at CNN for a few years. And then I left that to start my own company because Ken and I had this idea for Good Shop that I was so excited about. And then right after I started, MSNBC called me and said, we're doing this show about entrepreneurship. And I wasn't going to turn that down, right? It's right in my wheel. It was only meant to be for six months. And wow. so now it's been, I think we're in our 11th year. Yes. So I, it, it's, it turns out, though, that it's been so helpful for my journalism, my show, and my company because... I, when I'm out there on the show talking to small business owners, I know the second question to ask, right? It's not just, you know, give me five tips on blah, blah, blah. I can ask the next question because I'm asking for myself, right? Sure. As much as for my viewers. And so I think it's really, I do not think I would have done um, or that I would be able to do nearly as good a job serving my audience if I hadn't had this, this very experience I'm going through at the same time as them. So speaking of the show, uh, how has it evolved over the years? I mean, think about when you first started. It was the six-month project. Here you are in your 11th year. How uh, has the show evolved from your perspective? Oh, my God, Leo. It's, the world has changed, right? We've watched sure. the world change in these 10 years or 11 years. So when I started, Fortune Small Business Magazine was shutting down. All of these things that focused on small business were disappearing. There was no focus on female entrepreneurship whatsoever. And, and right, there was no, maybe Facebook was just starting, right? So there's no social media. There was MySpace. And so 
and so it has become so much easier as far as resources go, not necessarily psychology or anything else, but as far as resources to start a business and to run a business than it was when we first started. And so we've just, we're speaking to a much larger audience than we were now of people who feel like, Hey, I can do it. Whereas they wouldn't have necessarily felt that it was a possibility early on. I think what hasn't changed is our mission to go out there and truly try and give useful advice to um, small business people and growing businesses really it's not just small anymore but I, I because entrepreneurship has become such a thing right and so many we've seen so many incredibly successful stories and when I was a kid right the entrepreneurs weren't the cool ones it was the people who worked in the music industry or you know now they're the cool kids and so and, and their shows like Shark Tank and the profit which I think are wonderful and and bring business ownership to a wide world, but those still have an entertainment value. It's fantastic. We're entertaining, but our mission is really to give practical advice to small business owners. And, and that hasn't changed over the past 11 years. Well, and I think what you did also was not only with what you do each and every week with the show, but the idea that you basically assembled and, and you know, compiled all that information for people in what was a, a book, which I love the title of it, Your Business, 183 Essential Tips That Will Transform <laughs> Your Small Business. And there are. I mean, I've obviously gone through them all. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. But, you know, those tips were very much informed by real entrepreneurs with real stories uh, that they shared with you, correct? Absolutely. And the gist of it was, so keep in mind, I launched my show, launched my company, got married and had three <laughs> kids within five years. Yeah. So I felt like I do not have time to read a you know, 200 page book if I can get that same information in a paragraph. <laughs> and so it was very much for me as an audience. And the idea was, I've talked to thousands of business owners. What are the things that I said, whoa, I need to go do that at Good Shop when I talk to them. Let me write a page on it, move on to the next thing. So it's not meant to be read page one through page three. Right. You know, you're supposed to be able to open it at any page and just learn something quick. Well, and what's nice about it is, although it's 183 tips, it's, it's obviously chunked up in some sections where you can look at an area that's of most interest to you and really take a deep dive into that. You know, I think about not only does the book allow you to kind of almost be in the same room with all of these entrepreneurs and all these small business owners who, who share this information, but I almost imagine a peer group taking this book all of them, you know, taking a section of it that they would find most relevant to them, going back and reading it, and then coming back. Because when we learn, you know, we learn so much better, not just when we read the book and we try to figure it out all on our own, but imagine people reading this book, taking a section by section, coming together, and then sharing some of their own experiences and insights and takeaways that they get, I think would really be remarkable. So actually, for peer groups out there, if you haven't uh, you know, looked at this book and used it in that way, I think it would be really great, uh, you know, if they did. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, your whole thing is, is about peer groups and, and that's basically what this book is. It's giving you a peer group of, it's basically advice, just quick advice as if you were talking to a friend. And what I say, and this is why what you do is so important, Leo, is we don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? Most of what we are doing has been done before in some way or another. And you can absolutely shortcut your learning process if you just talk to people and listen to people. Well, and none of us does it by ourselves. You know, I look at, uh, you know, your career is amazingly successful uh, as, as you've been and, and you are. Uh, you didn't do it by yourself. I mean, you've had so much like we all <laughs> like we all do all along the way. And, you know, and with that, you know, in addition to, so in the book, uh, you talk about things like having a board of advisors, you talk about peer to peer lending, you actually have a whole section, of course, just dedicated to building relationships and how important that is. One of the one of the tips that I'd love to talk about, because I, I think it comes up often, especially now with the results of the Edelman Trust Barometer just out right now in that we tend to uh, be pretty set in our opinions. We're not interested in a lot of new information, particularly from people who don't agree with us uh, oftentimes. But you talk, uh, you mentioned specifically 
about the importance of like meeting new people every week mm -hmm. is, is one of the tips. So I, and I guess I want to ask you that how we can make it not just about meeting new people, but meeting new people who kind of see the world a bit differently than we do and inviting them into our circle and inviting them into our life. You know, this tip came from a guy named Ari Wallach, who I, I tremendously respect. He's done all this um, great stuff in his career. And he said that every week he goes for a coffee with somebody new. And if he can runs out, you know, the deal flow of new people has, <laughs> has slowed down a little bit. He just goes on LinkedIn and goes to a friend of a friend and says, do you want to have coffee? It's such a good idea. And the key to this, so if you want to get people with, with different perspectives, it's easy enough. Go find them. It's not that hard. LinkedIn, through friends, you just meet someone at a party, just ask them for a coffee or a drink. But the real key to this is listening. I mean, it's very easy for us all to, as you said, just sort of shut our ears. You talked about it politically or socially right now, but also in business. If someone says to you, hey, I think you should be doing this differently, or I, this is how I reacted to that piece of marketing you put out or how you're describing your business really easy to say, oh, you just don't get it. But if someone's saying that, you, you better listen and see if there's actually some truth to it that goes beyond this one person. You know, the, the other tip on relationships, and it's funny, I don't know why I, and I don't know this, of course, for sure at all, but um, I remember reading the, the tip, on, um, tip 147, uh, <laughs> be, the, be the first one at every event. That's my and, favorite one. And, I love that. Well, when I thought about it, and this may be untrue, but I don't know why, but I kind of felt like, I bet that's something her dad told her, or that's something he believes in. Is that possibly true, or it, is... It, I mean, it seems like something my dad would tell me, but it's actually not. If I'm trying to remember, I think it came from Eric Kaufman, who is... Um, he, he started a company, um, he was also an agent for a long time, he ran a company, but he, he's the most outgoing person that I have ever met, right? The most friendly, everyone gravitates towards him. But he said, and this was so brilliant for those of us who are a little shy, and by the way, almost everyone is at some point, is if you go to an event after everyone's already there, which is your inclination, if you feel a bit uncomfortable, everyone's already in their groups of three or two or five and it's really uncomfortable to kind of worm your way into that conversation if you were one of those first awkward people there in the beginning where no one else is there you found your group mm. because all are there together talking to each other because no one else is there it was so it's so counterintuitive and so smart that's correct very cool tell me a little bit about um kind of a little maybe more broadly how you see the value of relationships uh, when it comes to running a business? I mean, where do you not see the value of relationships? Um, they're, they're, so there's kind of the big broad ones where you just simply need support because it's hard, as we all know, to run a business. So I got a phone call from a very close friend of mine the other day. She has um, what by all intents and purposes, looks like a business that is doing so incredibly well. And um, consumer-wise, it is. They're getting a lot of consumers. They, they're doing great, great brand, brand awareness. Um, she called me in tears because a big client just pushed back their order. It's still going to happen, but it's going to happen a month later. And that messes with her cash flow, and she can't figure out what to do, right? And this is a company that nobody, nobody would know had any problems it's doing mm. so well and so right we talked about it she was on a, she left her office she went on a hike she called me in tears and by the end we were laughing and so and and then it simply just gave her the okay i got through it now i know you know of course i had to just deal with it but now i'm a little bit better sort of emotionally to go tackle this problem and you cannot discount that well, I mean, no question. I mean, having people we trust that we can actually have real conversations with, you know, to your point, we, we tend to operate on the surface. How's everything going? It's going great. Um, and yet there are things that you don't see, but beneath the surface, you know, and we all have it going on. And uh, there's no question about that. You know, when I was thinking about your show and all of the people that you've interviewed who represent so many different kinds, but I can only imagine that you have interviewed people who have companies and make a living at these companies that 
you didn't even know existed as like a career or a job or anything, right? I mean, I mean, when you think about all of the opportunities and options people have, you know, we, we grow up and we have, I think, a really limited understanding about what we can do for a living. And next thing you know, you've got people starting companies in areas that they never would have imagined in a million years. I mean, I'm wondering maybe what are some of the uh, companies that you found to be maybe a little most different uh, in terms of the ones you've interviewed over the years? I'm trying to think. That's a, that's, it's interesting, right? I mean, it's a totally valid point because you could turn anything into a company right now, right? I wouldn't necessarily have thought a closet organizer would have a incredibly successful company, you know, right. with a lot of closet organizers working under her. Um, but I think I am just so used to now that you could have a company doing anything that I can't Think of, I mean, we've, we've gone and interviewed some really neat organizations. A bunch of years ago, we met a guy. And you could see my daughter peek her head in there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I am working from home today. Oh, she's that's, so sick. That's good. Um, she's so getting a got, lesson in entrepreneurship. Help, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> This is this is what I love is having the kids get to hear it all. Um, but a guy who was a mountain biker and lived in Cleveland and didn't have a place to go mountain biking in the winter. And so he built this enormous indoor mountain biking park, which now successful and professional mountain bikers from all over the world come and practice in his cavernous warehouse. And it's so cool. Wow, it's Just, right. It was amazing. And so you know, I don't think, wow, how do you make a company out of it? Because I just saw it as a company, but it was really, really neat and, and successful. I think what I love about entrepreneurs, though, is they see a problem that most of us kind of have become uh, content to live with. And they're like, I don't have to live with that. It, you know, if I want a place to indoor mountain bike, I'm going to build one. And and they they are problem solvers in that way, right? I mean, I think it's so fascinating that they they kind of find a problem to solve for and they know they're not the only one that has it or they know that, that other people have it and that um, if they can do it really, really well and ideally maybe do it better than anyone else can do it, they're going to be really potentially really successful. Yeah, it's really neat. I just interviewed one of the founders of Kickstarter yesterday and about, you know, exactly exactly that was was why they founded Kickstarter, but also how they how they think about where the company's going and they think of themselves as in service to creative people. And so they've solved the funding problem, right, in, in some way. And he was just talking about how he wants to now solve other problems for them, right? So what other areas of need do these people have and, and how can Kickstarter then begin to, to help them with it? So any particularly favorite stories that um, you wouldn't mind uh, sharing with our listeners today that uh, from your show mm -hmm. um, that uh, and maybe stories that speak to the fact that someone didn't try to do it by themselves, right? That they, they sought, uh, whether it was an um, advisory board or maybe just calling a friend, <laughs> you know, like you had the other day. Um, mm -hmm. Any particular stories come to mind for you? Um, there is this one woman who I love, and she's, she's really one of the most inspiring people to me. She started, um, she had never worked before. She was a part-time waitress. Her, her husband was really the breadwinner in the family, and he had a medical issue. He was laid off from his job in the recession. He had a medical issue, couldn't get another job, and so she had to go back to work, or she had to go to work. They had, I think, $17,000 that they had inherited from an aunt, if I remember correctly, um, but that was basically it. They had been living hand to mouth before. Not not hard hand to mouth, right? They they had four kids and they were living fine. They had a nice house in Connecticut, but they did not have savings. And she had lost um, more than a hundred pounds recently on mm. some weight loss program. And she said she always wondered why isn't there a low fat bagel out there? And so this woman who had no experience whatsoever running a business or hardly even any work experience, said, I'm going to take the majority of that $17,000 and put it into my low-fat bagel business, which she started. And, and she's so funny. She said most of it went to the packaging, which is these kind of like lender's bagels, you know, that, that clear bag. Yep. And she said, you know, if it didn't work, I'd have all these doggy poop bags. <laughs> <laughs> but, but she just started knocking on doors and then started asking help from people around her. And because she was so passionate about what she cared about, 
people wanted to help her. And I think that's, and, and eventually she was successful. When I met her the first time, she had, I think, seven people working in her basement in her house. That was her office. When I met her the second time, they had moved into an office. She started some weight loss center. She's an incredible woman. But I think the, the key from her story is that if you can tell your story such that you're passionate about it, people just want to help you. They want to be part of something that's growing and that's exciting. And so I, I, I really took that away from her. And just as a person, she's, she's so incredible. Well, and it's hard, you know, to miss the, the fact that, you know, when you think about your uh, work as an entrepreneur and as a storyteller, right? I mean, they, that you have a really, I think, special appreciation for that when people can do that and they can do it really well. And you see how it connects with people and how it can make a difference in people's lives. I do. You know, the thing about video is you cannot be saying to your kids, go away <laughs> with nobody looking. <laughs> She's great. No, she's, she's been peeking and visiting here and there. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't even noticed until I just saw that. I should have turned on the television. The, the perfect babysitter. There she is again. <laughs> Why don't you just sit here? That way you won't disturb everyone, okay? <laughs> she's, you can too, get part of it. <laughs> she's totally fine. Yeah. Well, this is real life, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. She's uh, in getting her own exposure at a young age also to being an entrepreneur and a journalist and, and, and all. Um, you know, one of the cool things. Oh, go ahead. I think you're going to say something. Um, wait, but what you asked, you just asked me a question. My apologies. I got, I got a little distracted. <laughs> well, we were talking a little bit, of course, about storytelling and journalism and right. yeah. Right. The ability to tell your story is everything from getting people initially interested to getting customers. People again, want to be a part of something or have a product from something that has a story to it. And my friend, Justine, Stamen Ariaga did this so incredibly. She started a fellowship program called the Teak Fellowship Program. And she started it when she was in her 20s. She was able to get some of the most impressive people on her board. And, and some people say, oh, it's because it's a nonprofit and it's really easy to tell a good story from a nonprofit and you're helping kids. It's not true. There are lots of nonprofits um, with, with leaders who aren't able to tell the story as well. But something about her ability to really paint the picture and really get people excited about her as a leader made it so that everyone wanted to be a part of this. She would talk about it all the time and get people to help her. But I mean, she would barely even, she'd ask them, but, but she wouldn't even have to ask them. They'd be dying to help ahead of time. You know, I had a presentation trainer that I worked with um, a number of years ago. His name is Tony Lowe. He's just really terrific. And he always talked about how important it is to illustrate, don't explain. And that's where storytelling really comes forward, doesn't it? I mean, really becomes super, super effective. And um, you know, when I started good, when I started Good Shop, and and there were no iPads, right? No iPhones, etc., or, or tablets. <laughs> um, I used to walk around with printouts from my computer of, look, this is how it works, because. It was hard to explain. It wouldn't capture people's imagination in the same way. And so I would, you know, literally pull it out of my bag and spread it out at a dinner table or wherever I was because you just couldn't do it as well just talking about it. So you're, one of the things about your book, now it's a number of years since it came out and business is changing quickly. And yet at the same time, I found it really, because I kind of reread it recently, and just find so much of the information in that book timeless, which is so nice, right? I mean, it is so, you know, these things don't change. Our relationships matter. They're always going to matter, regardless of the digital world we live in and all. In fact, um, you know, you talked about the you know, the importance of face-to-face -face communication, how much, so much more important that we connect with people face-to-face -to -face today, maybe than ever. That comes from my father. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one. That's my dad. Yeah. And it's really true. It, it's it, it, there are nuances when you write something down, you know, in email or social media that people don't exactly get. And it, it's it's just a basic tenet of of you know our of human nature is that you just automatically connect with someone. I believe a little bit more when you have some time with them face to face. And so I say always, if you can at least initially have some face to face with them, you can do everything else on computer or phone, et cetera, afterwards, but, but build a little bit of some connection with them face to face. It, it, it's a, you can have, you know, it's, it's 82,000 emails or one five minute conversation. So, 
183. I figure when you were writing this book, you squeezed every ounce of whatever great advice you could and got it down in 183 tips. Since then, um, what might you add to that? I mean, in, in recent years, of course, you've had that many more interviews and all. And I'm not sure if there's any, you know, if you've got anything specific in mind, but I would imagine that if you sat down and thought about um, everything since, that you might be able to add to that list, I would imagine. Yes. Yeah. I could probably add a whole nother book full. I actually have a list somewhere on my computer that I need to find when someone gives me something. I can't think of anything exactly offhand sure. right now. Um, but yes, because I'm constantly hearing things where I think, oh, that's so smart. That's so smart. That's so smart. And so I should write a blog or something on it. But yeah, I, I we wrote this book maybe four years ago, five mm -hmm. years ago. And, you know, just in my own company, which has grown so much since then, I've I've learned so much, right? We've, we've dealt with employee things that I didn't deal with before, marketing, you know, excitement, disappointment, and I, I've just learned so much from that. Well, I think between your show, your book, and just the example um, you set all around, I mean, you really are bringing business and Main Street business into people's homes and into people's lives in a way that I think just really shines such a wonderful light on some of the amazing things that are happening, uh, you know, in this country. And uh, it's really extraordinary. And I just want to, you know, ask you maybe just one more question and sure. say, is there any, if you think about either those 183 tips or anything that you want to leave our listeners with, with one uh, nugget uh, of advice that you think would be helpful for them as they uh, look forward to 2017. Uh, what might that be? Um, somebody told me something yesterday, um, which I, which I actually, there are a couple of things within the same vein where they said the, and, and I don't know if your um, listeners are having good times in their business or hard times in their business, but I'll give this for anyone who's having an uncertain time, which is, uh, this person uh, that I'd interviewed yesterday morning was just talking about how, how things were a little bit tricky in his business right now. And he said, I'm having a great time. That when, when things were going well, he kept thinking, is something missing? Is something, what am I doing? You know, where, where are the flaws that I'm not seeing? And now that things are a little bit harder, his path is incredibly clear. He knows what to do. And so while he's a little bit stressed, He's having a much better time with his business. And, and, and someone a couple of um, weeks ago said to me something similar, which is don't let your, don't let your dreams become your expectations. <clears throat> and they said that when things are going great, your dreams become your expectations. And when things are hard, they stay dreams and it's something to work for. And that to me, I, I don't know, it just, it really crystallized something that I felt I could understand through all the entrepreneurs that I've spoken to over the past 10 years. Oh, that's such great advice. And um, so I just want to thank you for joining us today. And, you know, who you surround yourself with matters. And you, uh, that was certainly demonstrated today with your daughter joining us uh, for part of, the, uh, part of the program, which was wonderful. But anyway, you just have a wonderful uh, day. Thanks so much for everything you're doing and look forward to your show. And uh, for anyone who hasn't uh, reread the 183 tips, you really need to do it. So thanks so much. By the way, you know she's home today because she is sick, and I am feeling like I was totally duped on that. That does not look like a kid who is sick. Yeah, she's, she's looking pretty uh, you know, spunky today. Uh, hey. Thank you, Leo. It's so, so great to see you. Hey, you too. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us today. To learn more about Peer Advantage, to submit questions to Leo and our guest, and to subscribe to the Year of the Peer podcast, please visit us at leobatari.com. That's L-E-O-B-O-T-T-A-R-Y.com. This podcast is produced by me, Randy Cantrell, hosted, of course, by Leo Batari. Music provided by Kevin McLeod, Vibe Ace, Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 License.